You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Uh, We've read a chapter tonight in Genesis 6 that didn't mention the word fossil at all. That's got a lot to do with the subject, as we will find out. So fossils, there's things, extinct fossils, and that's immediately the sort of language we use when we're talking about these creatures that lived a long time ago, we're told, and they don't live anymore. Well, some of them don't, most of them don't. So the extinct, that picture I have up there is something, a little creature called a trilobite. Doesn't matter if we've never heard of that, but they're extinct apparently. They don't live today. And there's billions of them being discovered in the ground in various places around the world, in great big heaps and heaps of them in places, and they've died out. You can see how there's a lot of labels there. You can't read the labels, I'm sure. It doesn't matter. Lots of bits to that, though. It tells me that's quite a complicated little creature. It's not just a one cell or something like that. It's actually got lots of different parts to it, even though it's supposedly many millions of years old. Now, there's also living fossils like that. That's, that is an authentic fossil. That's what the label says, isn't it? You can see that up the top there. Authentic fossil. I think that's a view, Adrian. <laughs> Um, we often get mixed up between us. So there are things, but the point underneath this slide is this. There are things people call extinct fossils, but there are a lot of living fossils too. How does that happen? Things that supposedly died out many hundreds of millions of years ago, or several hundred, but which are still alive today. That's a bit of a question we'll have a look at later. So if you're going to a museum like the Adelaide Museum, I haven't got pictures of that, it's something a bit more exotic over in Africa. The Museum Africa in Johannesburg. And you go in there and you can see a picture of the entrance way into the museum. And you are immediately, you see right behind me, there's a picture. You probably can't see the writing on it, but it says something about 3800 and six more zeros after it, years old. That's 3.8 billion years old. So that's where this museum believes the first signs of life were found. Don't quite know how they measured the age, but there's some guesses they have, which we'll have a bit of a look at. Then it goes through and looks at some smaller numbers there, 2.3, I can just see here. Sorry, it's a poor slide, but look, it doesn't, the detail doesn't matter. But it's depicting the evolution of life over years based on the fossil record. And then there's a fresco there, that that wall chart thing that runs around the wall, which is common in a lot of museums which show how for one very simple organism like perhaps a jellyfish or something like that, developed all these other different creatures and then finally up to human. That skeleton, that's not Uncle Lincoln, that skeleton there, and the end, that's, pardon? Hasn't got a coat on yet. That's, that's the, the modern man who's standing upright. He's come all the way from being bent over like an ape and standing up in the last few hundred thousand years or something of that order. So that's the, that's the classic depiction. If we don't happen to be able to go to South Africa to see that, well, perhaps we could go up the river between Manham and Swan Reach and Black Hill, there's a little map up the top, but fairly near Swan Reach, there's a place called Shell Hill. Has anybody been there? I know Ron Hollenby spoke to me about it and one or two other brethren have been there. So there's a great mound which has now been chewed away by, because the, the shells there were used for garden purposes with the uh, Thomas Playford's garden, I understand. So they actually got stuck into this great mound of shells and only a little bit is left. And that's the little bit that's preserved now. It's a monument. It's a deposit of oyster shells up to six metres thick. It's dated, now this is the important bit, it's dated five billion years old. That's what the sign says out the front, five million years. 
Only the, it's the only one of its type above the surface of the Earth in the southern hemisphere. We can go and visit it if we want to. So somebody says, ah, it's five million years old. In a typical museum display, we'll see these things called ammonites, which is an example of which a broken one I have here. But I just want to make sure we're clear about the definition of a fossil. Well, there's lots of different sorts of fossils, and I'm only talking a very narrow range of things here. And by the way, I'm not, uh, if I say I'm not a paleontologist, what do I mean? What do I mean if I say I, I'm not a paleontologist? A paleontologist is a person who studies fossils, that's right. And I don't, so I'm very ignorant really about this matter. So if I have errors of fact, I'm very sorry about that. But I'm not an expert and should be careful about what I say. And we should all be very careful about what we say on subjects about which we are not expert. But we do know a bit about our Bibles. So as I said, the fossil is the remains of dead creatures which have been, those remains have been turned into mineral or stone. That's, if they're turned into stone, they're, they're petrified. And they could be simply shapes. So you have a jellyfish, there's no hard parts to that to turn into stone. They just disappear, but they leave a shape in a rock. Or a tracing, a trilobite, you can have trilobite tracks, apparently. That leaves a, a tracing, which is then fossilised. Well, how is it fossilised? Well, it's fossilised by by not just, let me step back a bit. You, have you seen pictures of, of uh, in books of swamps and trees which were many millions of years old and the trees just sort of fell into the swamp and turned to fossils? That's rubbish. Because if that happens, the tree doesn't turn into a fossil, it simply breaks down, like today. When trees die and things die, leaves, leaves don't preserve a their shape, unless they're covered with many tons of dirt or sediment and preserved quickly. So there were certain conditions that existed on the earth before, before our day, because you don't really see many fossils made today. There are certain conditions that existed that preserved creatures and then gradually mineralised, or the minerals from around penetrated inside this creature and turned it to stone as well. Well, when I say stone, I'm using that loosely. Turned it to be very, very hard. It's no longer living. So I've got a whole bunch of fossils up here, as Matt mentioned. And one of those is this bivalve, which is supposedly extinct. Um, the other is this ammonite, that curly one. Which is very much, which is like a, an extinct clam or oyster or shellfish of some sort. Uh, squid also belong in that same class, apparently. The mollusks. Now we use the term occasionally. Perhaps I don't really know what that means, but a certain class of sea creatures that this class has been made extinct. I've also got on that picture, and there's an example up here, of a piece of this shell that's come from Shell Hill that was given to me by a brother. And in that little old tobacco box that my dad had, not that he smoked, his dad did though, there's a few little curly uh, looking shell type fossils. A bit of an array there, and yeah, they're all genuine fossils. But the question is, how old am I? Oh, I'm not talking to you. How old is how old am I? How old? Again, any guesses? Probably before the flood. Uh, how old's that then? Okay, around about 6,000. Any advances on 6,000? Do I have 10,000 in the corner? Do I have 2 million years over here? Do I have 20 million over here? Oh, I've got 400,000 million years over there. No, that's an exaggeration. But how old is that? We don't actually know. But well, we can get a bit of an idea, probably. And I think Langdon, other Langdon's, Uncle Langdon's heading in the right sort of direction. So if we were to look up a textbook, and I, as I have, we would find this sort of information. That, that this fossil here that I'm touching, that I'm holding, is 
somewhere between 65 and 200 million years old. Now, that's extraordinary, isn't it? That I'm touching this thing that's that old. The problem is, I don't believe it's that old at all. I believe that that's a false statement and that it is probably of the order of four to 6,000 years old. The flood, we believe, occurred around about 4,500 years ago, Noah's flood. So that was the reading we had tonight. You can start to see a bit of a connection with the fossil business because I guess I'm saying the Bible has a very good explanation of the existence of fossils, which is the flood. And more importantly though, and we don't really want to just restrict ourselves to talking about fossils tonight, because it really doesn't matter. But what does matter is the Bible, though it's a very old book, has really important lessons for us today. That's the bit that really counts. Not the question of how old this fossil is, and is it really this old or that old. So let's think about then how people explain fossils. How were they formed? And there's two different explanations for that. One is science. Now, I've put science there in inverted commas because I guess I did a bit of science. I've worked as a scientist throughout my life. But science really means a subject, an area of understanding where you can test ideas. You can do experiments. You can make predictions. You say, if, if this is true, then if I do this, that should happen. And when that happens, you say, oh, that was probably true. And you do it a million times and, hey, you've got things called facts. But you can't do that with evolution. So that's the subject we're really talking about under science tonight. Evolution, that is that the simple creatures like jellyfish and, well, even bacteria, the simplest of the fossils, that they eventually became more and more complex over many millions of years, billions of years, sorry, and became the, the most complex, complex creature on Earth. What's that? Woman. <laughs> no, man and woman. Both very, very complex. Both, we are extremely complex creatures. Our brains are just quite different, and male and female brains are different, but both beautiful. And both tricky. But the science, though, is based on a principle called, oh, there's a big word, how many syllables in the word? Uniformitarianism. And I remember learning about that in university days, did earth sciences and whatnot. And basically that's saying the present is the key to the past, but what does that mean? It means that over many, many ages, millions of years, what happens today, what we see happen today, is what happened then. It really means there was no Noah's flood, worldwide flood, that didn't occur. What happened was what we see happen today. Sure, it's occasional volcano, flood here and a flood there, but mainly it's uniform processes so that when we see big layers of rock, cliff faces with lots and lots of layers of rock, we can be assured that all those layers were laid down at a very constant rate. Bit by bit, each year, hundreds of years, thousands of years, millions of years, billions of years. And bit by bit, all the sediment, as it's called, all the sand, has got a certain thickness to it. If you know how quickly that gets laid down, you can make some assumptions, you can work out how much thickness that represents. That's, it takes um, a thousand years generally we see today for a riverbed to build up so much sediment therefore if we've got something that's a hundred uh, meters thick and that was a one meter say well that's a hundred thousand years it, you, don't forget the maths but you can calculate look at the thickness know the rate at which it's laid down and work out an age a time on the assumption that it's always happened at the same rate for all time. Now, that's the, that's the uniformitarian business invented by Lyle and Huxley, two great people in the geological world. Over this time and over these strata, as we call them, these layers being laid down then, creatures have lived and they've died. 
and when they've died, they've turned to fossils, and lo and behold, we can see them. But as they've lived, they've become more, more advanced, more complex, they've evolved. So we go from the bottom of the geological column to the top, we see very simple things here. We go very complex things like human beings up there. The problem with that, all of that though, is we end up dating the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rocks. Oh, how old is this? Oh, this has got fossils that are 25 million years old in it. How do you know? Because the rocks are 25 million years old. How do you know that? Because the fossil is 25 million years old. How do you know that? Because the rock is 25. So hang on, hang on. How do we prove one of those? And most of that evidence was laid down by simply saying, well, if it's that thick, it must be that old, which was a complete assumption based on, well, that's what we see today. So fossils, according to science, the age up to 3.5 billion years, 3.5 thousand million years old. And some of the oldest ones are supposed to be in Western Australia, and they're called cyanobacteria. Single cell, not very complicated. I'll tell you something about that. Every single cell bacterium is hugely complicated, extraordinarily complicated, let alone multicellular organisms like us. So let's not be fooled by that statement. The thing about the scientific model is that there's no place for God in the Bible, there's no place for creation, and there's no place for the flood. What about the Bible? Well, the Bible declares to us that in the beginning God created and he made kinds, which are very similar to species, individual species, which, I mean, which are all unable to reproduce between them, which are all different. And there's million, literally millions of them, quite extraordinary really, all producing offspring after their own kind. But maybe one and a half thousand odd years after the beginning of creation, we read about it tonight in Genesis chapter 6. Noah's flood called, caused extraordinary catastrophe. So a catastrophe is opposite to uniformity, if you like. And a lot of creatures were buried alive. Then sediment built up very rapidly and these creatures were pres preserved, well they weren't alive, but preserved as fossils. Now I might say at this point, when we're talking to evolutionists, we can't, they can't accuse us of being the only people who've got a, a position based on faith because they weren't there either and nobody can prove what happened in the beginning. So our position is very much one of faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. But we, we're quite happy to say, look, I have faith. God exists and I have evidence for that. The evolutionist and I've quizzed at one or two on this, don't like to accept they have faith, but when they're confronted with this statement, they have to say, hmm, I see what you mean. Because the evolutionists believe that nothing plus nobody equals everything. Nothing. In the beginning, there was nothing. And there was nobody, there was no God. But somehow out of that was everything. Is that faith? That is faith. That is huge faith. So we're not alone in requiring faith. Hopefully ours isn't a blind faith. We see evidence, we see design, we see extraordinary design even in that fossil. We say, somebody made that, rather than this design but it just kind of happened all by its own little self. Now I just want to make a comment here in passing because if there were really scientific people amongst us who had done geology and knew about dating methods and stuff like that, that's not internet dating by the way, they would say, ah hi. You're all wrong in your time scales. Just remember I said before about dating rocks by the thickness of strata, basically. Not that in any one place on the earth you have all of these strata built up at all. You have bits here, bits there, and the geologists put these things together and build up a column, a geologic column it's called. That doesn't exist anywhere on the earth. Bits of it, layers of it do exist, Grand Canyon and many, many other places. But I've highlighted a bit here uh, some, 
because there's another way of dating that's called radiometric, radioactive decay. You have radioactive molecules. Each year they break down and decay, it's called, and they turn into different elements as they go. And over many thousands, or sometimes over only a few, few years, like carbon, or over many thousands of years, millions of years, like potassium, um, they, they break down into non-radioactive components. So you measure the ratios of these radioactive versus non-radioactive components, and you work out an age. There's a huge amount of assumptions in all that. But I won't go into any science there, but I'd just like you to highlight the, see this highlighted bit on top of the slide. Remarkably, when samples are collected from recent volcanic eruptions, for example, Mount St. Helens in the US, that was, when was that, in the 1980s or so? A lot of interesting stuff came out of that. Um, and when they are dated using the potassium argon method, that's a radiometric dated, dating, radioactive decay dating method, supposed to be absolute. The dates obtained routinely conflict with the true age of these rocks. Okay, so this is evidence from a book, Contested Bones, 2018 book. It's a very, I haven't got it, but I've read bits of it. Very interesting book. So there's basalt or, or um, volcanic derived stone. We can tell exactly when that lava came out of the volcano and started to solidify and therefore be called a rock. And we can measure the age using radio, these standard measuring radioactive decay methods. Okay, so we know historically when this stuff occurred. So let's look at the one I've highlighted, Mount Stromboli. Does anybody know where Mount Stromboli is? Italy, it's off the coast of Italy near Sicily. It's an active volcano, it has been for a couple of thousand years apparently. If you look up on the internet, Mount Stromboli, you'll find that six days ago there was lava coming out and it's quite an impressive thing and it keeps, they keep on updating it uh, week by week, day by day. Well, okay, that, erupt, that has had constant lava flows but this particular sample of solidified lava, 1963, that was gains, that was when quite a few of us in this hall were still alive not that long ago. And the dating is 2.4 million years old, according to this uh, infallible, that is, you can't disagree with it, method for dating rocks. And if you go down the columns there, when lava was extruded from those different sites, including Hawaii is in there as well, Mount Etna, which is also in, in Italy, when the rock formed, when the measurement of the age measurement Quite often, it's millions of years older than it should be. Would you trust a method like that for dating? I wouldn't. And that's the point of this particular article. If that's, they are, it's, you can test the method now and prove it doesn't stack up. You can't test it if it was 300 million years ago sort of thing. Nobody else can say when it was there. It's only if it's his, happened in recent history, you can say, I know when that happened and when the rock formed, I am testing it and it doesn't stack up. So no further comment then on that. It's a subject in its own right of which I am not really competent to speak about. But that's a very interesting information. I just want to go through then a few examples of Q&A, question and answer for evolution. So this idea of slow development towards complexity and then fossilisation as we go over the centuries. There's a real problem. When you look at the fossil record, there's a sudden appearance of all forms of fossils. It's called the Cambrian explosion. Now, nah, here we are, getting technical again. But look, it's just a handy little thing. We'll get back to that. I'll show you some pictures. There's four things on this slide. The second big question, and it's not me saying it's big, you'll see who it is saying it's a big problem. The absence of intermediate forms in the fossil record. There's no convincing transition fossils. There's actually nothing that shows a really good bridge between the ape and the human. You might think, oh, surely there's a lot of work done. There has been. I'll show you a slide later, though, which shows, oh, the evidence is not good. There's huge gaps there. So it's saying, when you look at the fossil record, 
each species is separate from the other, just like today. They don't blend all into the other sort of thing. We don't have wings, for example, even though we've probably got some ancestry to birds, according to the evolutionists. We've got only arms and legs. Thirdly, there's places we can see in the world great mixtures of all sorts of different kinds of fossils, some of which were land originating, some of which were from the sea. And also, when you look at dinosaurs like T. rex, everybody's heard of T. rex. You heard of T. rex? Tyrannosaurus rex, the dinosaur? Haven't you? You have tonight then, for the first time. He's a famous dinosaur, huge, the king of the dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex. Anyway, you can find tissue in there. That's not bone, it's not fossil, it's blood. Bits of DNA that hasn't decayed yet. It's soft tissue like the uh, elastic on a blood vessel. This has been verified and we'll see, I'll show the evidence for that. Getting back to this then, the thing called the Cambrian explosion, about 500 million years ago, we are told. Now notice on this thing called the geologic column, right at the very bottom, right down here, there's a thing called a Precambrian. Now my red writing there says, it's claimed that this Precambrian grey zone at the bottom is occurred between 3.5 and 0.5 billion years ago. So all of that time is this Precambrian, and there were very, very few, well, there was fossils there, but they were only things like bacteria. Nothing really complicated, oh, except in Ediacara in the Flinders Ranges, where they've come across some quite complicated creatures which belong in the Precambrian. Hmm, doesn't make much sense, anyway. But you come to this next layer, and you do see in places this Precambrian thing with not many fossils at all, and all of a sudden another layer sitting right on top of it, which is full of millions of different sorts of fully formed creatures, just like that. Layer with virtually nothing on top, lots and lots and lots, particularly sea creatures. Hmm, that's a bit of a challenge for the evolutionist, that is, or for the, for the traditional paleontologist. And then the picture here shows that gradually different layers which have different uh, types of material laying down and different fossils, sorts of fossils in them. They say this represents the evolution of species over the years. That picture actually doesn't occur in nature, the whole picture. Line, certain bits of it do, and certain kinds of, of strata are often associated with certain kinds of fossils, but they're not always by any means. So really that's, that Cambrian explosion thing is about the unexpected variety. There's 40 major animal groups suddenly appear in the geological record. They weren't there one time, and all of a sudden they were there, fully developed, quite complex creatures, as you can see. It's an incredible variety of sea creatures in the main without any ancestors below them. It's a mystery to evolution. Now, is it really a mystery or is that me making out that it's a mystery? Um, well, it's, I'll show you, it's not me making out. We'll get to that in a moment. A very important person said it's not me making that out. I just mentioned this in passing very quickly, just the yellow bits that are highlighted. So it's a Professor Roger, a Professor John Long from the Flinders University, and in the Encounter magazine, which I get, he wrote an article about uh, paleontology, fossil looking. And he made the comment that slow evolution view is archaic, that means it's out of date. This is an evolutionist, this is a thorough evolutionist recently saying, you know that slow business, bit by bit by bit over many millions of years, years, that's out of date. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up. The real measure of evolution is when innovation appears. So for example, having arms, front limbs, spine, hind limbs, three semicircular canals in your ear instead of two, which helps you for balance and sensation, teeth, jaws, millions, not hundreds of different characteristics. That's real evolution, I agree. They are all major innovations in evolution. Just what prompted these major innovations around 150 million years ago is not clear. 
but Professor Long says it's tied to genetics. Wow, what an insight that is. I could have actually told you that. It's tied to genetics, but what made the changes in the first place? So really, he's admitting that the slow model doesn't work, but he's got a bigger problem because all of a sudden, massive changes occur in a very short space of time. One evolutionist called that the hopeful monster theory. Stephen Jay Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould. What about missing links then? That's another serious issue. Serious for, oh, it's for Sir Charles Darwin. So we go to his Bible, The Origin of Species, and we quote from it. So I'll quote page 287. I've got it on the, on the screen here. Charles Darwin, he's the one who invented, well not invented, but he formalised the theory of evolution in this book, which is a really important book in 1859, and which really challenged the Bible. He said the Bible is not necessary to explain the origin of life. This is how it all came about in this book. I'm telling you how it came about. In reading parts of this, though, I'm say I am impressed. He's very cautious about what he claims and admits, as he does here, there's a lot of problems with his theory. Why then is not every geological formation, that's that column, and every stratum, that's the layers, full of such intermediate links? If one species evolved into another, surely as it was evolving we'd have an intermediate link and that we fossilised and we see that in the fossil record. Why don't we? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection that can be urged against the theory. That's page 287 of his book in this particular edition. Hmm, that's very interesting, isn't it? Furthermore, and I'll read, if I might, from pages 311 to 12, at the end of this chapter, the several difficulties here discussed, namely that though we find in our geological formations many links between the species which now exist and which, we, and which formerly existed, in other words, we can find, if we go to the, the fossil record, we can say, oh, you know what, we've got a kangaroo. Oh, there's a fossilised kangaroo there. They look very, very similar. We can find those links. We don't find the cross links, though. We do not find infinitely numerous fine transitional forms closely joining them all together. The sudden manner in which several groups of species first appear in our European formations, the almost entire absence, as at present known, and still the case, of formations rich in fossils beneath the Cambrian strata are all undoubtedly of the most serious nature. He's being honest there. The, the absence of those intermediate forms is a serious issue, he is saying, for his theory. So, um, thanks, Mr. Darwin, or Sir Charlie. What about fossil mixtures? Now, I'm going to have to step on the pedal a bit here, so I'll miss out a whole lot of slides, which I have. Go to Fossil Bluff, northwestern Tasmania, a whole bunch of land dwelling possum like marsupials are dumped in together in the same graveyard of fossils with whales. They've come out of different habitats. They haven't just died where they were and they're fossilised in, in place. There's been evidence of a great water borne torrent dumping them all together. Sounds a bit like the flood? I think so. What about the Dinosaur National Monument in Utah in the US? It's the um, there's, in that there's dinosaur, you know, one of the large, it's a huge place, 850 square kilometres, millions or thousands of large fossil bones, and the hint all the way through that is it's very, very old. You know what? It's a fossil, so it has to be old, doesn't it? That's the idea. But there's fossilised dinosaurs plus clams. Mm, clams are sea creatures, dinosaurs land. What are they doing together? fossilised. The evidence is that they were all um, brought together with floodwaters, buried in sediment, 
hardened in time and then and fossilised over time. And at the end of it, there's the rapid folding of rock layers and erosion towards the end of the flood period. So the flood actually, I think, and I have to look at this a bit more, it's a really interesting area of looking at, the flood actually explains the fossil record in many, many different aspects of it. Um, the writing in green there uh, indicates where the groups of fossils are ecological zone, series of zones rather of created kind living in different environments at the same time. So when we see a fossil layer, it's saying what's happened is in a certain environment, everything that was living there at the time has been bundled up together, dumped and fossilised, which is exactly what we'd expect to happen with the flood. Now this one's a really interesting one, difficult dinosaurs. Now dinosaurs, as everybody knows, and this is repeated time and time again in the, in the um, media, 65 million years ago there was a great asteroid storm that hit, hit the Earth, a 10 kilometre diameter asteroid in fact, and it wiped out dinosaurs and 75% of all living species at the once time. That's what we're told. Um, many birds actually survived this, as they did the flood, by the way, because they were protected during the flood because they could fly. But what we find is soft tissue and fossilised bones. So you might say inside this fossilised shell, they've opened it up and said, oh, there's some soft tissue that's like, it's like flesh. It's the original creature that hasn't been turned to, to bone. I wonder what that's about. Because if it's many millions of years old, that's impossible. It's just impossible. It has to be a lot younger than that. And so it's caused a lot of consternation. The ages have been wrong. You can be a fossil, but you don't have to be really, really old to be a fossil. And this was work which was done by uh, uh, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who published an article in the Science Journal in 2005. At the time, this created a lot of contention amongst fellow paleontologists. They said, oh, impossible, rubbish. You've got some contamination in your sample. It's not really uh, fresh tissue at all. It's come from somewhere else. And a lot of toing and froing. But ultimately, the scientific community, paleontologists, now agree she was right. You can get out of dinosaur bones, you can get soft tissue that hasn't been degraded. And you can do tests on them. And it behaves like it should. Red blood cells and DNA as well. No one expected soft tissue to be found in dinosaur fossils, but these discoveries really made sense if the bones were buried only a few thousand years ago during Noah's flood. That's really what that's saying. Pretty important information. Now there's three others which I will short, quickly just mention without going into any detail. Polystrate fossils, living fossils, and other fossil anomalies. Polystrate fossils are fossils that of trees, for example, which span many millions of years. Impossible. Evidence for that, I think, is a little bit weak. The evolutions have got answers to that, and I'm not really comfortable with that one. Living fossils, no change for millions of years despite changing climate. The Wallamai pine, which was kind of discovered west of Sydney in uh, 1994. It's supposed to have been extinct for two million years. But the thing about it is, like so many other things like this, it um, hasn't changed. Like the coelacanth, thought to have been the fish to tetrapod, the thing with four feet link, and gone extinct 65 million years ago in 1938. It was discovered, no change. 65 million years, in fact, in longer than that, probably 400 million years, it hadn't changed. It had not changed, despite changing climate. And then this one here is really interesting to me because the fossils say that man did not descend from the ape. So if we're challenged about that by somebody, oh, we know we came from apes, just know this, that in the Nature a journal, it's a scientific journal, probably the most reputable one in the world, in the year 2000 there's been subsequent articles to the same tune. The writer there, who's an evolutionist, says the once popular fresco, remember back in the African Museum, we saw that 
thing that ran around the wall, and there's a representation of it in that picture below. A once popular fresco showing a single file of marching hominids, human-like creatures, becoming ever more vertical, tall and hairless, now appears to be fiction. It just is not adding up. Apes and men, according to the fossil evidence, lived together. Apes didn't come before men. Men didn't come before apes. Apes and men, according to the fossils, lived together. So one didn't evolve from the other. See the logic? That's what the experts now are saying. And so when you talk about the, the fossil evidence for the human tree, the, the, the derivation from one form to another, it's a mess. None of the branches leading to, from this to that actually occur. The fossils, it's, it's confusion. They're going back to have a think about what's going on. So, conclusion from the fossil evidence was that there's no evidence for evolution of the major forms of life on Earth. Fossils, if you say fossil, it doesn't really mean really old in terms of millions of years. And we have to be careful of that. We hear people saying, oh, fossils are, yeah, of course it's several million years old. No. There's a good case to be made, brothers and sisters and young people, and any others who might hear, there's a good case to be made that, in fact, fossils aren't that old after all. We've been brainwashed and conditioned to believe that that's the case. But there's good evidence to say, no, you know what? That may not be the case at all. The takeaway message is that Noah's flood is the better explanation of fossils. It explains them far better than the traditional scientific so-called means of explanation. But really, it's not about fossils. Tonight is not about fossils. It's about belief in God and the warning of the flood. And the fossils simply warn us of God's coming judgment. So when I see that, what one way of thinking about it is, or apart from the fact it's a evidence of creation, something has made that. The other side of it is, why is that fossilised? Because of the flood. Oh, why the flood? What, why, what happened with the flood? Why was the flood? There's a judgement. We read about that in Genesis chapter 6, and we read about it in our Sunday school lessons. Because of the wickedness of man in turning away from God, God said, no, 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 no. The end of all flesh has come except for Noah and his family. I'm going to intervene and judge the earth and send a flood. And we see the evidence of that worldwide in these extraordinary beds of fossils in pretty well every continent. Well, I have a question. What about Antarctica? I'm not sure. I have to check on that. So God has judged in the past. 2 Peter 3, 3 to 7. I've got four key quotes here about the, the Noah's example, the lesson out of Noah. 2 Peter 3 is a warning against believing that God's gone to sleep. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing will ever happen. And the Apostle Peter said, wrong. God will intervene at his appointed time. Be ready. Acts 17, 31 32. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the earth in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, in the, and so on and so forth. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a day of account of judgment coming we will have to appear before our God. And fortunately, he's a God of mercy. Matthew 24 is a warning to believers from all ages about apathy. It's saying, just remember what happened in the days of Noah. People were going about their business day to day. Oh, it's all, it's all going cruisy well. It's not always going cruisy well, of course, but oh, just going on and on, and we do this and we do that. And, and suddenly, a flood came and destroyed them all except for those with Noah. That's the message there. So it's a message of using our time while we have it to, to worship our God. Romans 1.20 is a really nice quotation here, basically telling us we don't have an excuse for unbelief. Jeremiah 51 is a really nice quotation if we think about this whole subject. God has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. What we see, and what we see evidence of, is evidence of God's power to create, and his wisdom and understanding to 
create as well. That's what our eyes tell us. When we see creation, we say, ah, God made that, because it doesn't come out of nothing. Just want to conclude with this. This is visiting another museum in Christchurch, New Zealand. And as you can see an inscription across the top there, though these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion of him is heard. That's in Canterbury in Museum in Christchurch. And the, the, we learn this, we truly learn this from the museum, not those funny pictures we saw which are artists' impressions. These are, what we see in the museum are only the outskirts of God's ways. And since we can't understand this whisper of him, in other words, we see little fragments. We see a little bit here and a bit there, and we're really having trouble even understanding that. Since we can't understand this whisper of him, how will we understand the thunder of his voice? So brothers and sisters, young people, friends, we're urged to stand in awe of our creator. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.